exciting. So everybody get ready for a wonderful night of storytelling. Well, well done. Um, thanks everybody for being here. This yeah. is so exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say. Uh, uh, true that that uh, you know I, I was the producer of this project and, and honored enough to be able to help bring your story to life. But but in this room, I do think being Zippy's brother uh, probably sets me up as being even more uh, you know accomplished <laughs> or in, in exciting. Um, but this has been uh, this has been a labor of love for the filmmaking team of NIAD for the last seven years and really excited to now get to the point where we get to share um, our version of Diana's story with the world. Um, but uh, these events are really exciting, at least for me, um, because there's the movie and then there's what inspires the movie and there's the human behind the character, um, obviously portrayed by Annette Benning, but, um, but Diana and, and uh, her best friend and um, uh, confidant, you know, uh, uh, and compadre along the way, Bonnie Stoll, who's here tonight. Um, <laughs> you, know, you you lived this this um, this film and uh, uh, some of the awareness in this room, although uh, I'm sure not all, uh, comes from the fact that uh, that there is now a new catalyst and something to watch. But um, but you've inspired so many people with uh, this incredible, incredible feat um, and just your will and sheer endurance of 110 miles. Uh, 110.86. Uh, <laughs> anybody can swim 110. It's that last 0.86 that's going to get you. 53 hours? 52 hours, 54 minutes, 18 seconds. <laughs> okay, let's round at, it up. At, at the age of 64. So, um, really. so, I remember when it happened, and I also remember hearing about this um, as a potential film adaptation in 2017, and uh, obviously the events took place in 2013, mm -hmm. right? um, and my question was, why? <laughs> why are you doing this? <laughs> and um, why did you feel compelled at the age of 28? And why did you feel compelled at the age of 60, after 30 years not in the water, um, to pick back up on this dream? What was it about this dream? You know, a lot of people who um, adventure in extreme places on planet Earth whether it's trekking across Antarctica, walking the Sahara Desert, Jimmy Chin, climbing all the mountains. Um, it's usually something personal. It's something they either grew up, they grew up in the shadow of Mount Everest, or, or some, they saw something young and that was it. And for me, I was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, um, which in that era was where the boys are and how ironic that I was looking for girls. Um, but... I already had a love affair with the ocean as a child. That was our playground, our family. And the Cuban Revolution broke when I was nine years old. And literally overnight, those Cuban exiles had 24 hours to leave Havana, the rest of Cuba, with anything they could carry. And they came into my hometown. And so all of a sudden, uh, we knew about Cuba. My parents had danced salsa in the Hotel Nacional, which was the, uh, you know, the party place of JFK and Jackie. So we knew Havana, people living in Miami, Fort Lauderdale. But all of a sudden, in 24 hours, that magical island was forbidden. And I was a little swimmer. I was a, I was a competent little nine-year-old pool swimmer. And I stood on the beach with my mother one day at nine during the, you know, at the point of the revolution. And I, I was just filled as many of us were all around the world with the mystique of that beautiful island, Cuba, that now was forbidden. And I said, mom, where is it? I know it's right out there, Cuba, but I can't see it. And she said, it's, it's here. No, it's, it's right here. It's right across Havana. It's right across the horizon. It's just a bit over the curvature of the earth. So you can't see it, but honestly, it's so close. It's that close that you, you little champion swimmer, you, you could almost swim there. 
And honestly, people say, oh, this was a 35-year story from age 28 when I first tried it over to 64 when Bonnie and I finally made it to the other shore. But the truth is it went all the way back to age nine. I carried that, that little buzz in my imagination all those years. And then in my 20s, I became one of the best open water swimmers in the world. I held the records for around Manhattan Island, Capri de Napoli in Italy, across Lake Ontario. Um, and there were other great swimmers as well. But, but in my mind, all those swimmers were, swims were in this category. If you tell me you've swum the English Channel, I have respect for you. But all those swims are over here in Cuba. Nobody had ever made it. It's, um, it's not only a long distance, but you've got the, the conundrum of the Gulf Stream squeezing through the Yucatan Channel. And right here between Havana and Key West, that Gulf Stream is 85 miles wide, and it's going 6.6 .6 miles an hour east and you're going 2.2 miles an hour north so it's easy to do the math it's a very tricky tricky um navigational you know uh challenge and if you saw the movie or you read the book already um our beloved navigator john bartlett was a mathematical genius and he lived in those seas all his life so he took us across and he and bonnie she was on the boat that i was breathing imagine imagine breathing to your left this way for 52 hours and 54 minutes. And the only thing you see is Bonnie. <laughs> Bonnie, <laughs> Bonnie would be right over the side of the boat. She wasn't going anywhere. She was my soldier. And then put that into the four other tries. 48 hours this time, 51 hours this time. What about all the training? 12 hours this day, 14 hours this day. Every breath was Bonnie. So believe me, it looked like one set of arms. Believe me, we did this together. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see, Teddy. I think I'm, I'm getting it. I only wonder if she tells that story when I'm I do. I do. So wait, I didn't get to the second half of your story, uh, your question. So um, so you can see it was a it was a it was a drive. And I tried it at age 28 when I was in the midst of that decade, the 1970s, which were my 20s of swimming, and um, didn't make it the next year. The winds came out of the east for 91 days. You want to do this swim in the summer when the waters are warmest, it gives you the best chance. We missed that window. The next year comes, uh, 1980, and we can't get visas to go into Cuba. And uh, I gave it up. I... Um, I don't mean I gave up, but I gave it up. Uh, I was getting offers from the wide world of sports and from Fox News and from National Public Radio. It's time my time to make a living as a journalist and a storyteller. And I'm not going to complain about those 30 years, 30 to 60, following the best in the world, Tour de France, cyclists and uh, U.S. Open tennis championships and Olympic Games. But toward the end of that 30 years, I had a tremendous malaise of not being a doer anymore. I wasn't chasing any big dreams. I was following other people chase their dreams. And my mom died. And I thought, whoa, how much time do I have left? I met Christopher Reeve. He had fallen from his horse. Mm -hmm. And now he was a quadriplegic. And Chris was very big on regrets. Yeah. You have no idea what banana peel you might slip on tomorrow. Don't wait chase your dreams right now. So I was kind of filled with all that, read the Mary Oliver poem. I don't know about you all. I personally don't understand poetry. Um, every poem I've ever read, when I get to the end of it, I say, can't they use just one or two more verbs? No, something to get me through. But all of that was happening coming up to 60. And I thought, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give my job up. I'm going to, I don't care if I don't have any money in the bank. I'm going out and make that swim, the goal of my one wild and precious life. So I guess at this speed, we can only have time for three questions. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, and, and I promised from a, a Barbara Walter standpoint that I'll, I'll make you cry. By the end of these. But um, talk, to, talk to us about um, failure, um, because I feel like everybody knows uh, that you did this swim and that you accomplished your goal. But you, you also had to re-up your own determination 
so many times uh, and and live with um, trying to tackle these dreams uh, or this this singular dream that that um, seemed to be deferred. How how was it at, at, after twenty eight? How was it after swim two, swim three, swim four? Um, did you ever lose hope? And and um, and how did you find a way to continue to reinvest and to believe? You know, it's like it goes back to the Greeks, you know, who always spoke about the journey being more valuable than the destination. So you set off on on difficult journeys because the higher the bar and the more you're willing to have the courage to fail, you're going to discover who you are. The lower the bar, the more mediocre the bar, you won't get to know yourself at all. So this this dream was swim was so epic. So, so difficult. Others had proven that before me, um, that, that I was just filled with the imagination of what we discover out there. Our team was 40 people from the shark team to the jellyfish team, to the navigation team, to the medical team, to Bonnie and her immediate team in charge of my life and my safety. And we were on a journey of discovery and of grand adventure and Honestly, I, 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 I don't like to believe that I would have ever, you know, <clears throat> let it go and just been happy with the journey. But the truth is, each time we, you have to call it a failure because you didn't make it to the shore. You didn't get to where you said you're going to make it to. But the truth for us, it wasn't so much a failure. It was a journey. And like any journey we all take, I don't care whether, whether you're battling cancer or you're trying to climb Annapurna and you don't make it, you get through with, with where you need to go and you have more intel and more science. You're on a learning curve and you go back. You don't, you don't just go back with the, you know, the, the, the same procedure you had the first time and say, well, maybe we'll get lucky this time. Knowledge is power. And, and our team was smart and we, we researched and we believed. So I never did lose hope. I, I never did. I mean, one of, one of the funny moments Bonnie can tell you is after we didn't make it one time and the, the crew is beat up. They're tired. When we get, when, when they drag me out and by the way, Bonnie will tell you too, it was never me who said, I, I, I can't do it. I, I, I've bitten off more than I can chew. Mother nature on steroids, whether it be the deadly box jellyfish or huge tropical storms that won't relent and are we're in eight to 10 foot seas, we're blown so far off course, it's just like on Everest. If a 90 mile an hour wind comes and there's the summit, it's right there. You don't say, well, it's mind over matter. I'm gonna go, you're not gonna get blown off Mount Everest. You're gonna turn around and say, it's not my day. We'll come back another day. So we had to do that four times. We had the powwow with tears, with anger. It's not our day. 51 hours. It's not our day. We're going to have to come back another day. But um, I always, like, on not making it on the fourth time, I was lying on a boat deck, wrapped in a blanket, and, you know, kind of uh, semi out of it. All the crew was down and out. We're, we're sludging our way back to Key West. And I said, Bonnie. She said, what? Well, I said, you know what we got to do? <laughs> We've got to find the world's leading expert in the box jellyfish. And she came over and she said, could you give us a lousy 24 hours? You know, we just worked for a year. We're proud of ourselves. You know, we deserve a little rest and we deserve to just let this go. How about 24 lousy hours? And I said, okay, <laughs> okay. But 24 hours later, we were at it. We were at researching it and we found Dr. Angel Yana Gehara. And I know you, you gave us a visual of what it's like taking stroke after stroke and having Bonnie there, but to actually, I, I, don't, I don't know that any of us can really understand and process 53 hours in the ocean. What, what, what's that like? <laughs> and, 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 and combine that with, um, with currents, with storms, with sharks, with jellyfish that had at a certain point stung you near death mm -hmm. and then you went back in mm -hmm. and continued to go back and battle something that you knew could kill you 
I mean, I'm scared to go about like 10 feet off the shore of the beach and what might be out there. What's it like just psychologically? How do you, how do you process it? It's grand. You know, it is. It's a, you know, I, I haven't been in space, uh, but honestly, when I hear and I read about astronauts talking about seeing that little, as Carl Sagan put it so poetically, that little blue speck, the blue dot that is the Earth. When we were out there, and you know, you always hear in this sport, um, for those of us like Sarah Thomas, who's done the English Channel four times consecutively, 54 hours in the English Channel. So there are three of us who do the long, long swims who have done. And yes, you hear about all the um, hardships and the grueling aspects of it. But the truth is, um, there's nothing like it. You're, you're actually swimming over the curvature of the earth. You're traveling. You're looking up, and maybe you've read Stephen Hawking the night before, and you're looking up in the middle of the Gulf Stream in a summer night, on a clear night, you can see literally two billion stars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bonnie and I, um, it, it's, so, it's so, you know, we sort of tripped us out. We had, I'm used to having hallucinations, but I'm hoping Bonnie doesn't have any because um, <laughs> she's got to keep things together. But right, Bonnie, on one night, we both saw giant uh, fir trees, pine trees in the sky. You know, first I said, and she said, oh my God, that's what I'm seeing too. Huge trunks that go off the, over the entire horizon with giant boughs this way. And, um, that from the hallucinations to the thinking of their childhood is wafting to the Stephen Hawking of the stars. You are in, you are immersed in this blue jewel of a planet of ours. You're immersed in it. And so I'm not that swimmer anymore. Um, there are other things I want to accomplish in my life. And that was the Holy Grail Cuba. So Teddy, you and I could take the globe and it's, it's blue. And we could say, well, look, there are a thousand places you could swim. But in my 20s, I swam a lot of them. And Cuba was it. So now I want to be other things, do other things. But I don't think I will ever, it could bring me to tears. I don't think I'll ever have that sense of grandeur. You know, it's not an ego thing. It's an actual, we, we prepared for it. We trained for it. And we are capable of actually swimming that whole beautiful distance between that, that, that historic place, Cuba and Florida. When I got to meet President Obama, um, whom I admire terribly, um, I was in the Oval Office with him and he said, you know, because you know, one of his, you know, sort of goals was to bring our two countries back together. Um, he said, you showed us, your gesture was to leave this shore and shortly thereafter, touch this shore. And why can't we, why can't we in a short time bring our two beautiful peoples back together? So there's a lot to it out there, you know? And I, uh, I, I, I don't want to try to go recreate it. it. It could never be as magical as it was. Well, I think, um, I think what you've done might have felt singular to you and collective in the, the the team experience that you went through in order to reach the other shore. But, um, but I feel like I'm hearing so many people these days uh, tackle problems big and small and then say, well, if Diana and I had to do that <laughs> swim, right? Like I can get on the treadmill. I, I can deal with this issue at work. I can deal with whatever issues are happening. I'm hearing so much of the, well, if Diana and I could do it. Um, but what, what did it mean to you to, to to reach the other shore and to achieve your dream, and what what do you want other people to feel from that? On the um, on the strictly internal, personal end of it, honestly, stumbling up onto that shore was not a a, a big magnificent ego moment. Like we did it, we finally did it. What I felt was the profound satisfaction of not having ever given up on it. You know, we the, the, those those five attempts were grueling. And they all took a lot of year long training, you know, to each one. And so I remember literally standing on that shore and it was, it was, a, you know, you're, you're, you're reeling, you know, with all the people, it was very, very hot out. Um, Bonnie was there and I almost collapsed at one point. And, um, 
I remember thinking, flashing on looking at the alarm clock in St. Martin. We got up at 2 a.m. one day because we wanted to start a swim at 4. We had a 16-hour swim plan that day. We wanted to start at 4. And I remember looking, you know, you're in this cocoon in your bed, and you know that you're going to hurt that day. Um, and and you decided that Bonnie and I together had decided this is what this day needs, 13 <laughs> hours, 16 hours, we decide. And I remember... This is the training sequence. Training. Right, yeah. I remember flashing on that alarm clock, like watching the clock and thinking, oh, it's only 1.58. I have two more minutes to be warm and cozy. I don't want to get up yet. But when it came to be 2 o'clock, we set the schedule. We're the ones who set the training. You know, we could go to the movies that day. We could just, you know, say, fuck off. We're not going to train today. But we never did. We never took a day off. We did the hours that we thought were going to leave no stone unturned to give us a chance to get across if Mother Nature let us. But you're leading to something else, Teddy, and that is that I was aware. I was aware back in 1978, and I was aware when I wasn't making the swim, you know, in modern times, that other people were following and yes, there is some, you know, I don't know what you'd call it, but there's some admiration level to it. But the truth is what we hear from, and now that the movie is so successful, so beautiful, so powerful, we're hearing from hundreds and hundreds of people around the world. Um, people with Parkinson's, uh, young people who want to do something big with their lives from China, from Chile, from Wyoming. And what could mean more? Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of blown away. This movie has my name. I mean, how often does that happen? You know? <laughs> um, how often do you get you know, a tour de force set of performances from people like Annette Bening and Jodie Foster? Um, so, you know, yeah, the movies, <laughs> we're, we're rooting for them so hard for their, for their Oscars, you know, their SAG Awards. But, um, but in the end, what really touches me most deeply is people being inspired. And because we're no longer, you could tell us better, but we're no longer in that 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 movie um, sort of era where a movie's at the movie theater, and if it does well, it's there for six weeks, eight weeks, and then it's gone. But now because of streaming, people are gonna see this movie for a long, 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 long time. And we're so lucky to think that that people are inspired by it. You know, I haven't, um, I keep mentioning Bonnie, but there's another person in the room I want to mention. And that's my dear, dear friend, a kick-ass tennis player and my literary agent who brought this book um, to life. And that's Amy Renner. Stand up. Amy. skinny little legs you know look at these little legs over here. Um, you, you can't believe her running on the tennis court she's, she's like a mosquito she zipped over there and she zipped over there she's a fantastic player oldest person ever to get a 5.0 rating for the first time there we go that's, that, that's my naive moment <laughs> and, and, and by the way bonnie's a pretty pretty good tennis player herself yeah as a teddy bear I feel like that's 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 a wonderful segue from you know one seemingly lonely endeavor in in a marathon swim to another lonely endeavor in writing a book, uh, which is um, how how was the experience? How did you find the experience of trying to put your story down uh, on paper? I mean, I've I've read your book. If if anybody here hasn't. It's wonderful, um, and I think Thank you. it's no. It's really it's you not only feel um, feel the experience of 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 uh, just the, the gigantic obstacle of what you were trying to achieve, but you also really um, you're very vulnerable in the book, uh, and you give us a great sense of uh, who you are, who you think you are, who you've evolved to, your youth, um, uh, a lot of things that are hard to write about. Um, and I think you write about it with a, a wonderful level of um, self-awareness and vulnerability that I think um, just adds to the experience of the amazing accomplishment that you that you achieved. But um, but what was it like just having to having to figure out how to write a book? And I'm sure there's a number of people in here who not only are huge fans of uh, literature since you're at a bookstore, but uh, maybe authors themselves. And um, 
just that that experience. You know, there are memoirists. I love the word memoir. You know, it's better than autobiography. Um, it's but very there, fancy. Are, there are memoirists. I mean, Diane Keaton's one, for example, who um, write many different sections of their life. You know, in in books. And I didn't know if I'd ever write another one. You know, so I thought I really do want to include philosophies of life, my atheism, um, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, other values that I have and, and, and a whole realm of life experiences. And I never did, oddly enough, I don't know how many word or pages the book is, is it 400 pages, but um, the hardback, I never did make an outline. I never did. I just sat down and um, I, as a speaker, for instance, I, I, I'm lucky I go around the world uh, Bonnie and I did a, a did a, a show off Broadway, you know, right before the pandemic. So I am uh, something of a storyteller. And I, in this book, I wanted to, even though it's nonfiction, I wanted to, to take you with me. I wanted to, as a good storyteller, you take people to the sounds and the and the and and the, and the visuals and the smells of where you are, and bring them on the journey with you through the book. So. Um, I, I kind of, Amy can tell you, I kind of furiously got to it because this one was over. And um, uh, the movie can come out anytime, you know, as you've proven, 10 years later. It's not too late for that movie. Um, but the book, you, you after a real event, evidently in the world of publishing, you, you need to come out fairly quickly. So I had my computer on planes and hotel rooms. I was just getting it done. But I, 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 I'm the type, I don't know about you all, but I'm, I'm the type that second guesses everything. Nothing is ever, ever good enough. I look back at every relationship, every day, um, everything I do and say, why didn't I do it this way? I could have done it this way. But that book, I have to say, it's not perfect, of course. Um, but I felt very proud of it, and I still do. I don't, I don't have this overwhelming feeling of, I wished I had done this with it. I, I, you know, how about that part over there? I'll write other books, and I'm actually working on my first um, uh, children's book. It's a, it's a, going to be hopefully a, um, a series for uh, middle school kids. And just like I'm famous for saying, as I said on the beach at the end, you're never too old to chase your dreams. Well, this series of children's books, I hope, will be called You're Never Too Young to Chase Your Dreams. So it's about little kids who are like nine years old saying, why should I wait till I go to graduate school? I want to do that right now. And um, and they do, in, in, hopefully. So I'm, I'm working on that. But um, the point is that um, I, I I feel proud of the book. I haven't. It's one of the few things in my whole life I haven't second guessed. It's I, a very I, good book. And I want to also say Diana is one of the few people to accomplish something so extraordinary and write her own book. Every word in this book is your book. There's no ghostwriter, there's no collaborator, there were good yeah. friends and editors, but yeah. these are these are your words. And yeah. it's an extraordinary memoir and it really doesn't matter if you read the book first or see the film first. They both. You may not know this, but the book is for sale here. <laughs> um, your sister I, will be and, so and, proud. And, and, and I would suggest you buy it. Um, Go, let's go. Let's go. Hollywood inside baseball for a second. Um, you had to trust people that you knew hardly at all uh, to take your story and uh, adapt it into uh, a cinematic experience, recognizing that that uh, that has uh, a profound effect on you. You did so without um, having any approval rights over uh, how you appeared in the film. And um, did it, I think, based on uh, uh, fit and a little bit of luck. Um, but, uh, but that must have been really hard and kind of scary. And also, uh, the process of, of actually developing a feature film uh, and uh, how either quickly or slowly that can move, uh, I'm sure is also frustrating when it's not something that you're personally driving the entire way. Um, tell us about it. Well, you use the term inside baseball, so let's let's get down. And that is, and, um, you know, I, I've never, never lost the sort of umbrella emotion of gratitude. Never. When, you know, to, to have, um, these are all world-class people, and I don't know if you know Teddy Schwartzman, but we're talking about the imitation game. I mean, some of the great movies of the last couple of decades, Teddy has been, had the vision for and produced. And his partner on this, 
uh, Andrew Lazar with American Sniper, you know, some very high level, beautiful films. Um, and now let's talk about the, the actors we already have, but not to leave out Reese Ifans, who plays our John Bartlett um, brilliantly in this movie. He's sort of overshadowed by the, the two women leads, but um, uh, Bonnie and I have come to tears in calling Reese to tell him, you know, what we felt about his magnificent performance. And then, you know, the cinematographer is uh, Claudio Miranda. I don't know if you saw ever saw uh, The Life of Pi, you know, with the tiger in the ocean. That's his yeah. visual vision. He's the director of photography. Did I say cinematography? Yeah. I meant director of photography. No, it, it, it's the same. same. It's the yeah. same. Um, and, you know, he did the Avatar movies. He did Top Gun Maverick, you know, so the, to see that plane going through the canyons. Yeah. So he, with his special effects team, and I just made a video to thank them today because they won some big award last night. Um, they made the ocean that majestic infinitude, that raging and yet peaceful um, place that, that Bonnie and I fell in love with. And uh, so the, the movie is gorgeous. Who's the underwater photographer? Uh, Pete Zuccarini. Pete yes. Zuccarini did all the underwater shooting. Um, and we could go on with the composer, everybody. Bonnie and I are from the world of sports and we know a lot of world-class athletes. But the people who worked on this movie, they're all, including Teddy, starting with Teddy and Andrew, are at the upper echelon, you know, uh, uh, of the movie business. So um, to it, it, it is never um, escaped me to, to have the movie carry my name, to portray this this lifelong friendship with Bonnie, to show the grit that I, I truly have. And then on the other hand, if you want to get down, because how are you ever going to be happy with a movie of your life? You know, how are you, how are you ever going to say, I, I, there's nothing else that they need. You know, you won't. It's just it's just human nature that I, the only aspect that was very difficult, and Teddy knows this, we had many, many, you know, in, into the night conversations about this. I was something, if I can use the terms, of a visionary. I had this vision. And I brought, then with Bonnie too, this team together. Um, the, the John Bartlett's and this was 40 people who were believers. They, 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 they drank the Kool-Aid of, <laughs> of my words and my emotions and, and, and Bonnie and I commandeered this together. And in some ways I understand because a movie has to be just a slice of life. It's not a huge, wide sweeping documentary. So I have to forgive that right away and be at peace with that. On the other hand, the one aspect that just always rankled me was that the Annette character was portrayed by the writer and then the executive producers and the directors decided that this is what they wanted to make her me um, quite um, the dimension of unapologetic, relentless, I'm going to do this, I don't care, nothing's going to get in my way, and, and all of that's powerful. The audience who see this the film, they wind, they wind up, all of them around the world, walking out or in their in their homes writing us to say, I want to be more like that character. They admire that character. But for me, I'm a bit more, um, shall we say, charismatic um, <laughs> than that character. So I, I to be truthful, I, I had trouble with that. And we talked about it before the before shooting ever started. But Teddy and Andrew and the writer and um, and and the actors, they 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 held with their vision and it took me a while and I, I kind of lucky the strike happened because had the strike not happened I would have been a blabbermouth <laughs> and I would have said I would have made this point to the press but because the strike happened I couldn't talk about the movie at all and I came to peace with the audiences appreciating it I came to peace with I think we might have some press no, that's okay. No, because I, I no, no, I, I, you know, I, I assume that some people will tell right. this story after. Right. I'm, not, I'm not afraid to say it, and and you shouldn't be afraid to hear it because it's. I, I, I'd have heard it. I have heard it. <laughs> so I'm trying to make the bigger point that um, oh oh oh, I, I let go. This is their movie, and it's a beautiful movie, and it's and it's an inspiring movie. And can I be absolutely okay with the way my character is portrayed? Yes, I'm with it. I'm absolutely with it. But I'll just be honest with you, in those first few months, um, I, I struggled with that part. 
And I think anybody, the reason they make biopics about people who are dead is because <laughs> they're not around to you know, make their suggestions. And, and I was not given any control over the film. And um, in the end, um, they made it their way and they made it brilliantly. Well, I would also say um, the, the hope uh, and, and uh, probably the greatest um, ambition is to make a film that the subject, if you want to use that word, um, will be proud of and will feel has done uh, ne never the perfect job, um, but a, a job that does their achievements or their life or their essence um, proud. Um, and, and knowing that the people who are behind telling that story are trying to do it not only for narrative reasons, um, but to honor the subject and to honor the relationships and to honor the achievement. And I think from everybody who was involved in, uh, in trying to craft uh, your life uh, into a two hour uh, film, I think um, there was a combination of um, awe, respect, admiration uh and love for what for who you are and what you have achieved and i think at the same time uh one of the things that we found so um uh unique um to your story was also this incredible <laughs> friendship that uh you've shared with bonnie uh for 40 plus years um and um and the yin and yang of your relationship and so anybody who asks me you know well is Diana like that? I say, yes, but she's also even more inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's true. Um, and, but I, but I do think that, um, and again, we're now just waxing our own personal opinions. I think while, while Annette's character um, certainly can be acerbic at times uh, and focused with her own uh, relentless pursuit, I think um, what people leave that film with, hopefully, and it's great to just talk about your own film instead of having other people talk about it, but um, it, it is that speech at the beach, um, is that, that gratitude, is that appreciation um, for, uh, for, for friendship, for family, you know, either chosen uh, or found, um, but also an inspiration that it's not just about your accomplishment, but about um, people of a certain age, women of a certain age, people in general not giving up on their dreams um, and finding finding a way, uh, as cheesy as that sounds with the book title, Find a Way. Um, so I can't ever imagine giving up my life uh, to, into somebody else's hands to tell that story. That has to be so impossible. But I have to say, despite the fact that you complained every step of the way, um, <laughs> you did so uh, fairly and with a desire to ensure that um, that the film that we were putting into the world would leave people with the same level of inspiration that you hoped um, uh, your actual swim had and, and the fact that you had inspired time and time again, 40 plus people to put their jobs on hold, to put their lives on hold and to focus on something greater than themselves. So um, Kudos and to you, you did, and you did, you did. So in, in the end, the bottom line, because we're just here to really dig down and you know share every little kernel. But in the end, um, I'm so damn proud of this movie. Um, it, it just, uh, it, 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 it's rock on. Uh, oh, by the way, I don't know if I ever told you this, but um, uh -oh. way before, <laughs> well, before I'd met Teddy, um, I knew Andrew already. Uh, Bonnie and I have a friend in the in the movie business who's done some you know a lot of big movies, um, quiz show, and uh, et cetera. And I said one day, Gail, you know I'm not an actress per se, but uh, I do get on stage and I tell stories and I use foreign accents and whatnot. Should I screen test to play myself? And Gail took a pause and she said, Well, you only have to ask yourself one question: Do you want anyone to see the movie? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, you don't have to hit me over there with a hammer. She said, Diana, you can go and talk to groups in Tokyo, and you can do the off-Broadway. People go to the movies because they want to see a movie star, and we got a movie star. Yeah. Um, now, to that end, and, and, and honestly, I feel like we can... 
I guess before we transition to questions, um, I feel like we were supposed to shoot on a very quick schedule um, from the time that Annette Benning and Jody Foster signed on to the project. And then uh, due to um, Netflix coming on board the project uh, and uh, hurricane season that we probably should have accounted for, um, we pushed our schedule an extra nine months, which gave Annette about a year of, of training time to really um, try to match um, the, the incredible physical prowess that you had. Um, but I think in that time, you also got to really work with Annette and, uh, and, and Jody and the four of you would get together on a, a fairly regular basis to really get to know each other so they could try and distill something more of an essence of a relationship and a dynamic. But what was that process like? I mean, that was just, it was just wonderful. I mean, these two people, I can't speak for the rest of, you know, the, the, the acting world, but um, both of them, these two people, as different as they may be, are grounded, um, sincere, lovely, funny, smart people. You know, if you always sit down with dinner with them, there's nothing movie star about them at all. And um, uh, Bonnie spent more time with Jody, and I spent more time with Annette, and then the four of us you know, spent time together. And, you know, people are sort of uh, naive because they ask us and say, well, you know, did they take videos of you and see if you if you sit with your finger like this on your cheek? And um, they did none of that. They were just getting to know us. We got to know each other's dogs and families and we ate dinners together and um, shared a lot of laughs and, and, and sincere talks. And that um, son is a transgender uh, person, individual. And I had had certain, you know, opinions about transgender women competing against women athletes, cisgender athletes, and um, uh, we had we had really deep philosophical talks about that. And I I came to a place, and and Net and I respected each other over that. So there were just lots of different issues, and it it was wonderful. One um, hysterical thing happened on the set. Bonnie and I got to the set, and um, they shot you guys shot everything in the Dominican Republic, everything. Okay. They created Cuba, New York City, uh, Key West, uh, Los Angeles. It was all right there in the all Dominican. within ten miles of Juan Dolly <laughs> home, Dominican Republic. Yeah, yeah. So um, Jody and as I say, we knew each other quite well. All of us. Jody came off the set. She wasn't going to work for an hour or so. So she and Bonnie and I were just walking along, and she had these necklaces like this that were inside her T-shirt, and just to, I guess just uncomfortable. She pulled them out and she put them out like this, and we we're walking, and Bonnie stopped her and she said. That, that's odd. I have a piece very similar to that my father gave me. And Jody said, no shit, Bonnie. That, that's what we're doing here. <laughs> we, are, we are, I am you. <laughs> we, we had these necklaces replicated. They were, they were necklaces. And at that very moment, and that was sitting at, at a, on a stool about twice the, the length of the store. She was about to do an interview and she was wearing what I used to wear, like a white shirt with a cube across and short shorts. And Jody says to us, now see, Look at Annette over there. Do you think she wants to wear her hair? <laughs> no. No, she's trying to be Diana. So that's what we're doing. Diana. Anyway, we, we had fun and we had depth. And we will be friends uh, forever. The four of us. Well, thank you. This was amazing. I feel like we have time for questions, if anybody has any. I don't see any hands. No. I'm just I'm just yes. I feel aspired to be that person. <laughs> um, yeah, a, a, a lot of that. I mean, I'm I'm humbled by watching it, and I mean, who want, wouldn't want to be portrayed by Jerry Foster? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I aspire to be that person. You think she did much more? Than and, 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 and everybody should have a Bonnie. Yeah. Yeah. Bonnie, I'm realizing you should sit here. Uh, well, let's no, no, let's no. have no, 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 let's, no, no. let's have the two of no, you guys sit for just a little bit for questions because I, I assure you they're going to be for you guys. Please. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us some of the rules of that swim? Yeah. Like, you just eat with the tube in your mouth you never get out ever no one can touch it what are some of the rules she can't touch the boat and we can't touch her um but some of the rules were no sarcasm <laughs> it, it never works with 40 people i don't want to know what she or he did wrong 
people will handle it themselves. Okay, don't tell on people. It's just gossipy and silly. It never works. And another rule was never, if you get the chance to speak to Diana, tell her what time it is, how many hours she's been in the water, how many more miles from shore are we? Because it changes every minute because of that Gulf Stream. But we, on the crew, were mesmerized every day. Diana never saw the dolphins and the turtles, and the, and it was fabulous, really. But I, but I think you're asking also about technical aspects of a story. Oh, you were, I missed that part. And, <laughs> and, you know, just just the basics are that you are not going to have any aid in either moving, propelling forward, so that would be fins or holding on to some sort of rope or being pushed from the back or in flotation. So if you're going to stop and you're going to tread water, as Bonnie says, you're never allowed to touch the boat or touch the kayaks, but you can reach out and get a camelback hose and tread water and take fuel down. You can take a, you know, whatever we have to eat and take it down, but you, you can't be held up so that you could rest, you know, so you, you can't be helped in flotation or propulsion. And uh, that, that's, that's basically what an unaided swim is. Did you ever read the script before you guys film the movie? Yeah, yeah, and uh, Julia Cox is a... Well, she got nominated um, if by the right, Writers Guild. Yeah. That was really yeah. cool. It's a Writers Guild nomination? Writer, Writers Guild Best Adapted Screenplay. That's really cool. It came out yesterday. Yeah. Which point did you read the script? Was that early on? Was you that know, I on? actually wrote the first version of the script, and, and um, I'm a writer, but but I, I realized very early on, I'd been working on it for about six months, they say um, in the movie business that a good script is taught. I don't know what the antonym is taught is, uh, fat, but my script was fat. And um, I called Andrew Lazar one day and I said, what's our goal here? Is for me to become a screenwriter, which I didn't want to become. I just thought I knew this story well. Um, or should I let go and we'll get an A-list screenwriter who really knows what they're doing and help bring this, this inspiring story up. So I gave it up. There was another script, um, and, and everybody passed on that. And then this young woman, Julia Cox, uh, came in, and um, she's a good writer, and she's sensitive. And, um, you know, I mean, Teddy and Andrew had said they've seen a lot of scripts that was, didn't you say, Teddy, was one of the best scripts you'd read in a long time? Yes. And I would say the, the first script we had was, was also very interesting, and um, uh you despised it, and I think um, tonally it was very different and um, a little more poppy, a little more almost big short, you know, I Tanya break the fourth wall that mm -hmm. felt that, that, that was that was very well crafted, um, but just uh, tonally felt wrong. Um, uh, but it was good enough to get uh, for us to be able to submit to some interesting directors mm -hmm. and uh, Jimmy Chin and Chai Vasarelli, the directing team read it, said, we love the story. We don't like the script. And then we went and we found uh, Julia uh, who uh, wrote a new draft from scratch uh, that we worked on uh, very closely. And, um, and I think, you know, was something that we wanted to share with you once we thought it was ready. And I think um, Diana and Bonnie both weighed in, on factual inaccuracies, I think uh, Diana continued to. Um, I think I think in your head you always had chariots of fire as as a comp, and I think we tried to say if you made chariots of fire today, no one would watch it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So um, how do we do something that is more reflective of the personalities and the times while still being inspiring? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Who's back there? Way way back. Okay, I have a question. This is sort of for Bonnie. What brought you into this project? I mean, I know we've been friends, but what did you... Well, at first it was the tan that I was going to get, <laughs> if, I, if I'm honest. But um, I, when Diana brought it up, and I, I, I wouldn't commit to anything unless I would see something about it in person. So... I went to Mexico for a training swim and, you know, I saw what my best friend does best. And that was beautiful. And, and I'm sorry to back that up a little bit. In 1980, 
Oh, yeah. It was the era, I don't know if you all remember if you got into racquetball, but it was the era when mm -hmm. racquetball had its heyday in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. There were glass courts, uh, yeah. all the uh, real aerobics, um, you know, mm -hmm. centers had gone over to racquetball. There was a professional tour, men's tour, women's tour, and those athletes were hot at that time. They were, they were well known. Um, they had contracts. And so I went to play my first racquetball, professional racquetball tournament. I, I wasn't very good, and I knew oh, I was yeah. going to lose quickly. And a friend told me, when you go, you gotta, you gotta, you will lose quickly. So you got to go see this woman named Elaine Lee. She's such a fiery player. She's really exciting. So I lost quickly. I went and got a lunch, <laughs> and I heard all this screaming down at the glass court at this club. And I went down, and I sandwiched in. People are yelling. This Elaine Lee is like going horizontal across the court with her hand, with her body off, grabbing, you know, shots like this. And I, I, she was so exciting to watch, a really dynamic athlete. And I said to the guy sitting next to me, where's that Elaine Lee from? And he said, that's not Elaine Lee. That's Bonnie Stoll from Connecticut. And so we met that day, and I'm not sure. We have to do some research of it. But I became Bonnie's fitness coach very quickly. And... 35 years later, we switched roles, and I became the athlete, and Bonnie became my coach. So uh, I don't know that there's another story of that in the world of men's or women's sports. Yeah. Wow. Yes? Thanks for the wonderful conversation. I have a question. Could you talk about the sense of self versus team on this journey? You talked about the motivation being deeply personal, but at the same time, obviously, convincing the team of people to join you on the mission. So is there like that separation of self versus team and then that consciousness of like, oh, are all of this group of people supporting me or are we doing this together? I find that really I think, honestly, you know, a big question when I finally made it was, well, how could you possibly do this at age 64 when you couldn't do it at age 28? And one, we did train differently and we, and we knew more about nutrition. And, you know, it took us five times to learn more about the whole navigation, you know, and, and the jellyfish and the currents and all that. But I think the, the, the paramount difference was that when I was younger, I was more blustery and I was more ego oriented. And I was like, I'm doing this, you know, and I came over to, to knowing that I couldn't do it without the team. And so, yes, I was the one, you know, doing that, that, that hard work, the body athlete work, but the whole team starting with Bonnie, but John Bartlett, as I say, all of them, they all played an integral part. And, and we, we really, you know, each had a role. They all had a role. Mine was in the water, but their roles were were significant to, to getting across. <laughs> well, we just don't know where to go. It's like the paparazzi. <laughs> who, do, who do we talk to next? Yes. Um, how you mentioned sort of between your first attempts and then the more recent ones, sort of the malaise in between. And what? How did you find the motivation to do that? Um, and then how are you finding motivation now after the fact to do whatever's next and find that next passion? Yeah, you know, I don't know Serena Williams, mm -hmm. but let's just surmise that she's living a great life. Children, great husband, businesses, friends. But I would surmise that she will never know the high octane drama and thrill of playing in front of those thousands of people at a night match at the US Open, of having thousands of people around the world admire her as the best woman player, maybe one of the best players who's ever lived. So sports are cruel that way. You, um, you succeed when you're young and it's a, it's a tragedy that you probably won't feel that again. So I was lucky to come back into at an older age and get that again. But I'm 74 now and I'm pretty vital, you know, a lot of energy. I've got goals and dreams and I, I, I work on them, you know, with with fierce fire every day. But probably the Cuba swims, the biggest thing I ever did. And um, and, and it's hard to try to try to drum up, you know, that same that same depth of, as I say, high octane 
life that, that you had as an athlete. Um, but when you say, how did I get motivated? I mean, I wasn't in a state of malaise for the 30 years. I was enjoying that career as a sportscaster. It was, it was at the upper echelon of, of ABC Sports and National Public Radio. And I was telling stories about great, great people doing, you know, extraordinary things. But I got, got to the end of that 30 years turning 60 feeling like, but I'm, I'm just talking about other people. You know, right. and storytelling should be enough in itself. It 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 is. You know, it's a it's a it's a career. It's a it's a it's a career, and I I'm in that career. But um, there was something in me who wanted to go back. That dream was unfinished, and it had started at age nine. And I just I always felt it dangling out there. So it, it wasn't hard to get motivated for it at all. Mm. Yeah. Uh, wait. Oh. Dead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in the film, there's a few mentions of like a mental playlist of songs that were going on in your head while you're swimming. But I was really wondering what your real like mental preparation was, you know, to for those long, long. Swims you know, and, thank you. That and, and, and this is, by the way, Sibby's brother. Uh, um, Zibby's no. husband. Actually. Zibby, oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Stand up and say hello. Give, tell your name. Hi. <laughs> Excuse me, Zibby's husband. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's any better mental preparation to swim for 53 hours than swimming 16 hours and 18 hours and 20 hours and 24 hours. And, you know, then now you're immersed in it. You, you know how to get through those long hours. And so like a lot of um, Ed Vistiers is a friend of mine. I don't know if you know him, but um, he's a good friend of Jimmy's. But he's climbed Everest more than any human being the pure way without bottled oxygen. And um, I asked Ed at one time, because a lot of runners and cyclists, I'm sure you all do this, swimmers especially, because you're, you, you don't have much visual or audio input. So you're in the interior of your mind. So you start counting. And you start singing just to get through the hours. And I made goals, long-term goals. I could take a song like Janis Joplin's version of Me and Bobby McGee, and I would sing it a thousand times. The whole song, from the first note to the last, and it would take me nine hours and 45 minutes to sing all that way. But I asked Ed Vistures once what he sings up on the mountain as he wrote, and he said, I only have one song. And I was picturing he's up at the top of the world. He must be singing John Lennon's Imagine. He said, no, I sing, oh, the bear went over the mountain. Oh, the bear went over the mountain. So uh, my songs were, my playlist is of uh, my generation. It's Bob Dylan and uh, Neil Young, especially, you know, uh, out there in the middle of the night. I can hear that. Uh, you're not allowed headphones because headphones, um, you know, take away from the discipline that your mind has to have to get through those hours. Mm -hmm. So that's against the rules of the sport. Um, but I could hear that eerie in the middle of the night, especially that, that you know, that Neil Young falsetto. Mm -hmm. I hear you knocking at the cellar door. <laughs> and I mean, it would just sweep me away, even though I'm just hearing it in my head. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um. It came out today that we're like at a 10 year low of women characters in feature films. And I would love to hear what both of you think about the, the fact that this movie is not only about primarily two women, but two women who are over 60. And I wonder how you guys feel as a lead. So inspiring to hear a story that isn't just a I know, Teddy. Do you want to address that first? I had no idea that there's a dearth of uh, women <laughs> characters at the moment, strong women characters. Um, we just thought it was a great story, and um, and there really um, there are so many amazing actors. Uh, of a certain age, women in particular, who don't get great roles uh, anymore after they're past their perceived prime. And um, it's not a great talking point for two lead male producers in our 40s and 50s. Um, but we're just very sensitive. And, um, and uh, I just thought, my God, these women are incredible. Um, these women are incredible in the story. 
deserves to be told uh, whether um, whether it's what feels like it's in vogue or not. Um, people are going to people are going to be inspired by the story, um, and that's a testament to you. And, and luckily, that allows uh, you know Annette to be the one person you know over forty, I think, who's nominated for an Academy Award this year. So. Yeah, and I would or, add, and, and, and Jody. Sorry, I was thinking of best picture. Yeah, yeah. Jody, best and I, I think I would add to that is to say, um, you know, we could break it down and say how many sixty-four, and that was sixty-four, my age when I did this one when she shot the movie, and she's in a bathing suit for two hours, and, well, um, and but there's thirty-five days. And, yeah, and, and and there's never any um, you know shallow reporting of this. You know, her her grit, and by the way, she looks great. I mean. She was not a swimmer. You know, she was never afraid of the water, grew up in San Diego. She had worked on a fishing boat in, in high school or college. So she, she wasn't afraid to jog in there, but she never had a freestyle stroke. She never um, swam on a swim team. And, and for her to, uh, to dedicate herself, she had an Olympic swimmer, Rada Owens, who worked with her. Um, and, I, and I was with her a bit also. But, you know, for her to be absolutely unabashed about, I am playing this swimmer who wears a bathing suit, who goes out fiercely to swim, you know, 12 hours in the pool and 14 hours in the ocean. She made it as, as, as I was at 64. Was I embarrassed to come out on the shore in a bathing suit at 64? No. And so uh, I, I think that she, she clearly rose above all that. And no, nobody who ever reviews the movie talks anything uh, about anything but her being this athlete, you know, she's so swimming. She found her passion at this, <laughs> At this time in life, and it's really kind of fabulous. She swims every day. Yeah, she does. Wow. She loves it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we have to wrap it up now. Um, but Diana and Bonnie will stick around. I gotta say one more thing, and that is that you know, Teddy, you could tell me, but friends of ours in the movie business say to us, "You have no idea." how strong the commitment must have been from your producers to take this on and move quickly through getting the actors, getting Netflix, getting it shot. Um, you know, usually you linger around for, you know, a couple of decades and things fall apart. And um, the fact that you had the faith in me, in Bonnie, in our story, um, I'll never forget you for it, Teddy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So if you want your book signed, we're going to sort of start moving the chairs away so you can line up over here. Yeah.